our location is disjointed. Well, if that's the case, look to Jesus Christ, your Savior, who delighted to do the will of God, and his law was in his heart. And because those two things were true, because he delighted in God's law, and he delighted in the will of God, then he said, I do not hesitate to do public. I will proclaim your goodness. I will sing forth of your greatness. So Jesus was consistent. He was not a hypocrite. And he is our example. Question number two. For whom do you practice righteousness? For whom do you give, pray, fast, or preach, or study, or go to school, or run a school, or lead a church? Hypocrisy, in this case, is exposed in self-worship. The danger that's listed in every one of these is so that they may be seen by men, right? They may be seen by men. It's not really the approval of men that we seek. I mean, that's what it seems like. But the approval of men feeds self-worship. It feeds idolatry, right? It elevates us. And I think this can be the most vile and wicked hypocrisy of all because what we do is we use the worship of God as a front to receive personal worship, right? We, we take the worship of God and we masquerade behind that. And everyone thinks, wow, he is worshiping God. But really, in our hearts, where we want you to say, how great Curtis is. And then I feed on that. And I self-worship. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. But the essence of Christian prayer, or the essence of Christian give, giving, or the essence of Christian fasting is to seek God. What's the verse that says, you have said, seek my face, and my heart says to thee, your face, Lord, will I seek. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, the Bible says, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. John Piper warns us in his book, A Hunger for God. He says, the bottom line reward of this type of action, of doing it for yourself, is the praise of men. The praise of men. It's not really the eye of men that we want to see, but their praise leads us to the worship of self. That's what John Piper says. That is the greatest idolatry. We use the trappings of following Christ to elevate ourselves. And he says, in this, there exists two evils. The love of the praise of men and the false love of the worship of God. And this is what Jesus is warning them. He's saying, you're not giving to the glory of God, you're giving to be praised by others. Verse 2. You're not praying to commune with God, you're praying to be seen by others. Verse 5. You're not fasting to genuinely hunger for God and want more of God and depend upon God, you're fasting to be seen by others. You're doing this for self-worship. So in our giving, we pretend to imitate Christ who gave everything. In our prayer, we pretend to worship Christ. And in our fasting, we pretend to hunger for Christ. And all the while, we are loving and worshiping and pleasing ourselves. So the question that challenges us today, when we do our good deeds, when we, when we study the Bible, when we write the paper, when we grade the paper, when we teach, when we minister, when we knock the doors, when we go to the hospital and visit the sick, Hebrews says when we remember those who are in prison and we go to visit them, when the stranger comes to our door and we entertain them in hospitality, are we doing it so that others around us will say, wow, that Pastor Curtis, what a great guy. Is that our motivation? Or is our motivation to give glory to the one true God, the one who is worth all the glory? Again, Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example in not living for our glory. Isn't it amazing? The one man who could have lived for his own glory chose not to. Here's what he says in John chapter 6. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 12. Jesus says, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, Glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. When we start competing with God, 
for his glory. That is the pinnacle of hypocrisy. John 8, 29, Jesus said, I always do what pleases the Father. So let me encourage you, ask this question of yourself. For whom am I doing these things? Am I doing them for myself to receive glory to myself? Or am I doing them for the Father to give glory to him? Last question, why? Why? Why do you do what you do? Jesus is called the one who rewards. Isn't that amazing? It's said in every one of these. Chapter 6, verse 1, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Chapter 6, verse 4, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward. Chapter 6, verse 6, when, I, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Chapter 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the last question. Why, why do you do what you do? The shallow reward of human notice is no comparison to the recognition that comes from God. An attaboy from me, or your wife, or your church, or your professor, is not to be compared with these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And yet, like Esau, who traded his birthright for a bowl of soup, we can trade eternal reward for momentary pleasure. We can work all day long just so our congregation, our deacons, our classmates, and our professors will look at us and say, great job. And yet we have exchanged the great job from heaven for the great job on earth. Esau sought repentance with tears, didn't he? He couldn't find it. Trading in the eternal reward for the temporary reward is like David, who sacrificed the safety of his entire kingdom, the trust of his faithful men, and the sanctity of his family for one night alone in bed with Bathsheba. Trading in the eternal reward from Jesus Christ for the temporary reward that comes from human recognition is like Achan, who loved the treasures of Jericho, and by doing so condemned his wife and his children. It is like Lot's wife, who turned around one last time. She traded her life for one fleeting glimpse of a doomed home. And that's how we can be. If we put in effort and time and struggle for some other ungodly motivation other than the reward of Jesus Christ. It may be respectability. It may be money. It may be simple recognition. It may be a better job. It may be a grade. There's a thousand motivations that can motivate the human heart, right? Who said that our heart is a factory of idols? That's what we do. But yet Jesus says over and over and over and over again, I will reward you for faithful service. I will. Because I see the secret things. We can even take this in a, in a good direction. And we can make the reward about doing righteousness all about today. John Piper warns us about this. He calls this the horizontaling of holy things. This is what he says. There is a subtle sense that grows in us, usually unconsciously, that the real effectiveness of our spiritual acts, our righteousness, is the horizontal level among people and not before the face of God. In other words, we say, if my children see me pray at meals, perhaps they will pray at their meals. If my staff sees me fasting, perhaps they will be inspired to fast. If my roommate see me reading the Bible, perhaps he may be inspired to read the Bible, and so on and so on. And Piper says, this is not all bad. Jesus' public prayer certainly inspired uh, a hunger for God in, in his disciples and inspired them to pray. But the danger is that all of our life, including our spiritual deeds, our righteousness, starts to be justified and understood simply on the horizontal level for the effects that we can see in others. And so God suddenly and slowly becomes secondary in the living of our lives, in our righteousness. We may think that he is important to us because all these things that we are doing are the kinds of things that he wants us to do, but in fact, he himself is falling out of the picture as the focus of it all. And this registers in the motives of our hearts so that we feel satisfied when others are watching, but we feel unmotivated if no one is watching. So the secret lie is that if I pray for my kids, they'll start to pray, that if my kids aren't around, then I don't pray. That's the lie that we're warned against. 
And I can see that happening in a pastor's life. Can't I? Because a pastor's life is all about modeling. It's all about discipling. You read all these books and they're like, don't go to the hospital by yourself. Always take someone with you. And they're constantly teaching somebody else to do. And the danger is, the danger is, that we can start to evaluate our righteous deeds based on who sees them, even for good reasons. Because we want to teach, we want to model, we want to explain, we want to show. What Jesus is doing, Piper concludes, in Matthew 6, is testing our hearts to see if God himself is the treasure. So if we do good deeds and only Jesus sees, was it worth it? I mean, it sounds goofy when we say it out loud, but that is a real question. If your church never knows how hard you study, does God still get the glory from our heart study? If the church never knows how you dwell with your wife or your husband in patience and love, or how patient you are disciplining your children, if no one ever sees that, if your kids never understand the sacrifice you put into raising them, but God sees, is His praise worth it? If you try the best you can on your papers and you get a C, and God knows, is that enough? Is that enough for you? C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory says this. And no, it's not about mud pie in the slums or whatever that is, okay? <laughs> Everyone thinks that's what I'm going to say, but that's not what I'm going to say. And I want you to hear this when we done. C.S. Lewis breaks down the promise of heaven. He says there's five things that we know about heaven. One, it is that we will be with Christ. Two, we will be like Christ. Three, that we shall receive glory. Four, that we will, in some sense, be at a feast or a celebration. And five, that we will have some sort of official position as a judge, as a pillar, as a ruler. But this is what he focuses on, the glory that we get. C.S. Lewis said he struggled with this idea. How, how can God give me glory? How can God reward me with glory? And this is, this is his struggle with understanding appreciation of God. He says, after his struggle, when I had thought it over, I saw that this view of getting glory from God, getting appreciation from God, was scriptural. Nothing can eliminate this divine parable which says, well done, good and faithful servant. With that understanding, a good deal of what I had been thinking my whole life fell down like a house of cards. And suddenly, suddenly, see as Lewis said, I remember that no one can enter heaven except as a child. And nothing is so obvious in a child as its great and undisguised pleasure in being praised. Not only in a child, but also even in dogs and horses. Apparently what I had mistaken for humility all these years had prevented me from understanding what is in fact the humblest, most childlike, most creaturely of pleasures. Nay, the specific pleasure of the inferior. The pleasure of a dog before his master, a child before his father, a pupil before his teacher, and a creature before his creator. I'm not forgetting how horribly we can, this is, he's talking about how we can turn this wickedly. I'm not forgetting how horribly this most innocent desire to be praised can be parodied in our human ambition, or how quickly, even in my own experience, the lawful pleasure of praise from someone whom I admire turns to be the deadly poison of self-admiration. But I thought I could detect for a very, very short moment before this happened, during which the satisfaction of having pleased the one whom I rightly loved and rightly fear, feared was pure. And that it is enough to raise my thoughts to what may happen when my redeemed soul, beyond all hope and nearly beyond all belief, learns at last in that final day that I have pleased the one I was created to please. And isn't that amazing? That Jesus acknowledges you were made. You were put into the ministry. You were called to preach. You were called to teach. You were called to give and called to pray. He, Jesus, he's not saying, don't stop. He's not saying, stop. He's saying, do it to please me. Yes. Because you were created to please me. Again, our model is Jesus Christ himself. What does Philippians chapter 2 tell us? Jesus humbled himself. He became a man. He became a servant. He submitted himself to death, <coughs> even the death on the cross. Mm -hmm. Look how low he was brought. But his reward was there. Mm -hmm. And God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. So the promise remains true for us. Jesus rewards us. Don't be sucked in to doing righteousness 
for menial false rewards. Mm. Don't take them. Leave them on the table. Reject it. Back away. No, 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 no. I'm living for a better reward, an enduring reward that will come to me from the hands of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are the three questions you must evaluate when you ask yourself, am I practicing my righteousness to be seen by men? Am I practicing it only in public and in private? Am I practicing it for the reward of heaven or for the earthly reward that is here? What's your righteousness like today? Is it true? Is it hypocritical? I ask you, in a lot of the scriptures, to honestly evaluate your life today. Evaluate what you do and why you do it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Matthew chapter 6. Thank you for the humble words of Jesus Christ who challenge not just our outward actions, but the heart that motivates our actions. God, it is most dangerous for us, we who speak on your behalf, act on your behalf, we who do what you call us to do, we are the ones who can so easily and so subtly be sucked into a monotonous, traditional, rote way of practicing our good deeds, and we forget that we're doing them for you. We're doing them to please the one who created us. And that is the goal of our life, to live for the glory of God. Help us to fight against this subtle hypocrisy, this subtle religious tradition, and help us to struggle for true and authentic righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.